Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of the inaugural Free Press Fest. Uh, it's great to see everybody here this morning. We had a great evening last night kicking things off uh, with author Timothy Egan. Uh, I see some folks, uh, some familiar faces from that event last night, and I'm seeing some faces uh, who I didn't see last night. So it's great uh, to have everybody here with us today for this uh, inaugural event uh, here at the University of Montana. My name is John Adams. I'm the founder and executive director of Montana Free Press. We, of course, are the state's uh, foremost uh, 501c3 nonprofit news site serving all of Montana. Um, and you can find us at montanafreepress.org. My guess is most of you already know that. Um, I'm really excited to uh, be here this morning with you. We're really excited for, to have this incredible panel kicking things off. Um, and we're going to get to that in just a minute. But first, I want to make sure to give a, a shout out to the folks who helped make this event possible. I want to thank the sponsors and partners who worked and helped fund this event, including the University of Montana School of Journalism, the REN, the Montana Community Foundation, the Bacchus Institute, the Mansfield Center, and of course, the University of Montana. You are here for our first spotlight session of this festival. It's an exciting conversation with climate journalist and a data scientist on the ways our rapidly changing planet impacts our brains, our bodies, and our capacity for adaptation. Um, I've read Clayton's book, uh, and I was really blown away by it. I would recommend that after this conversation, when you're done with the festival, maybe tomorrow afternoon, you run out to your local bookstore and see if you can find a copy. Um, I am pleased to introduce the, mo uh, the moderator for our conversation today, my friend Darby Menno smith a writer, educator, and fifth-generation Montana rancher. Darby was a longtime editor at the Enviro magazine, environmental magazine Grist, after which she received her Master's in Fine Arts and Creative Nonfiction at Columbia University in New York, where she also taught writing workshops. At Columbia World Projects, she co-developed a program that teaches botany and creative writing to New York teens through tracing paths non-native plants took to arrive in the city. She recently returned to Montana to help run her family's cattle ranch near Boulder, Montana. Now that family's here today. Thanks everybody for coming out. <laughs> Uh, please welcome Darby Minow Smith. Thank you so much, John. When I was the editor of Grist, I was often asked two similar questions What makes you hopeful about climate change? And what makes you hopeful about journalism? I understood the inclination to ask those questions. It usually came after I had been, you know, hitting someone over the head with tipping points, or the consolidation of my industry, layoffs, IPCC reports. They wanted to leave the conversation not feeling totally depressed and like everything was lost. Those questions always kind of bothered me, though. It felt like the person was trying to neutralize the hard truths that we had just been grappling with. Uh, plus, I often didn't have anything that hopeful to share with them. Now, when it comes to Montana, and journalism at least, I have a good answer. Um, I'm such a huge Montana Free Pe Press fan. Uh, they have the model, the guts, and the people to really affect the Mo Montana media landscape. So I am so honored to be here today. Thank you, John. Thank you, team. This has already been a wonderful event, and I'm so excited for today's festivities. Mm -hmm. Amen. So, and thank you to all of you for being here on a Friday morning to talk about climate change on the brain. Not exactly an exciting, optimistic topic. Um, but it's one of those things that I think we need to sit with and grapple with in order to see those better paths forward. Um, I, I truly think that this book from Clay is the beginning of that conversation. And so I'm just grateful for all of you guys for starting off this conference and this weekend being here this morning, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Clay, Clayton pa Page Aldern. Um, I met Clay about a decade ago when I was still at Grist. Uh, we had recently launched a fellowship program that drew fellows from across the nation, you know, kind of the best and brightest uh, aspiring journalists who would go on to work at the New York Times or work at CNN. We kind of considered ourselves as, as the training ground for the next voice, um, voices of journalism. Clay was a standout among standouts. 
There was the undergrad IV education at Brown, of course. But he was also a Rhodes Scholar who um, was at Oxford studying neuroscience and public policy. So I was a little bit intimidated by his resume. Um, plus, I had that healthy Butte Irish skepticism of anyone who will willingly spend that much time with the British. <laughs> uh, in the early days, Clay was kind of what I expected him to be. Um, he went to the UN climate talks in Paris and translated really dense diplomatic speech for our audience. He read really dense scientific uh, reports and did the same. I was like, okay, yeah, this is what a scholar from Oxford is going to do when, he, when it comes to journalism. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until he started writing narrative journalism, um, some of the seeds actually for this book, that I really got to see what type of person Clay is. Um, he just extends such empathy to his subjects. He really makes you care about their stories. Um, he treats people with the same care that he treats science, and that really comes alive on the page. So this book, despite the topic, is immensely readable. It's funny, it's beautiful, um, it's, it's really a work of art. Um, so highly recommend you pick up a copy if you haven't already. In addition to uh, being a, neuro a former neuroscience who uh, writes about climate change, Clay uh, has written about homelessness policy. He wrote, homelessness is a housing, is a housing problem, which kind of explains itself in the title. Um, <laughs> but basically, uh, he and his co-author looked at all the factors that can affect homelessness and you know, kind of the, the, the usual factors that people blame, like substance abuse and mental health issues, and found that housing costs were the thing that really explained homelessness rates. And so that's why you know, progressive cities like Seattle and San Francisco and Missoula have high homelessness rates. And so that book has really changed the conversation when it comes to homelessness. Um, there was a big think piece about it in The Atlantic. Um, it, it's really shifting the conversation there. And I hope this book shifts the conversation on climate change because I think it deserves to. Um, it's just a totally fresh way of looking at the problem, and it's written with so much heart and empathy that I think everyone here would enjoy reading it. So, welcome Clay, one of my favorite brains. No shucks. <laughs> I, I thought we could kick things off by having you read a little bit from the intro. I would be happy to. Um, thanks for having me, and thanks for being in this room at 9 a.m to indeed think about the relationship between climate change and the brain. Um, I, I want to just briefly offer that, as Darby suggested, this is a book about neuroscience. It's a book about uh, kind of wet science, hard science. Um, and, and I hope to convey that those types of topics, when we think about them in relation to a changing climate, to in this world around us, this, this kind of nebulous everywhere we call the environment. It can be an exciting topic. It can be a topic vested with empathy. And, and so, you know, I, again, I appreciate you joining me on this um, perhaps nominally dry journey. Uh, and it is going to be my attempt over the next, let's call it, 90 minutes to uh, convince you that it's not so dry. So, so this is just, you know, page three. I'm going to try to offer a suggestion of what's in this text, and then maybe we can talk about it a bit. Absolutely. Um, the book's called The Weight of Nature. The story of your life is a plumb line, which is to say it has direction. You feel this direction because you point yourself in it every moment of every day. You decide to get out of bed, eventually. You decide to brush your teeth, or you decide to skip. Sometimes you decide to crack open a book beside your banana with coffee, Sometimes you decide to continue reading to the next paragraph. The direction is not wholly yours. It was hot last night, and you didn't sleep very well. You are groggy today, which is to say you are acting a certain way because you are feeling a certain way. That banana is smiling at you a little funny, and it takes two cups of coffee for you to feel a sense of control again. Sip, sip. Okay, 
You are becoming yourself. What happened is the world did something to you. It pulled at you, just a little, and you tilted off your course, just the smallest bit. It was barely at all, the flap of a butterfly's wings in the august maelstrom of life. <clears throat> but look, what we're talking about here is the opposite of the butterfly effect. There is no marvelous domino amplification of sneezes into tidal waves. No, all we care about for now are the little changes that follow the other little changes. It was hot last night, and here you are, reaching for a little more caffeine. And yes, it is still you who's reaching. The world's not doing that. You still get to make decisions when the world pulls you off course. What I mean is, your storyline still has direction. But there is something else in the room. There is a weight tied to the line of your life, and it points toward Earth. This is a book about your second cup of coffee. It is about the ways in which the natural world tugs and prods at the decisions you make, how it twists and folds your memories and mental states, how this nebulous everywhere we call the environment tips your interior scales. Sometimes these nudges are benign. You snap at your mother on the phone because surely you have had this conversation before and right now it is 95 degrees and your patience has run dry. Or maybe it's the air quality that's off kilter today. There's that wildfire across the state after all and you have an absolute whopper of a headache and you simply cannot focus enough to remember if your partner's birthday is January 5th or January 6th. You should absolutely know the answer to this question. Is it really the same day as the Capitol Hill riot? That seems too on the nose. And it is not so bad to forget a birthday or snap at your mom. You can remedy those kinds of things, even when it's too hot to sleep. But that is not always the case. Sometimes the world offers more than a nudge. Sometimes it pushes further, and sometimes you are changed forever. The ragged trauma of a hurricane, wildfires that melt people, the interior demons that check into the motel of your mind and never leave and somehow convince you to pick up the tab. There's the abyssal depression that descends with landscape loss, the cortex rotting diseases provoked by warming waters. There are, with us now, brain-eating amoebae and plummeting test scores and the shrunken brains of chronic stress, all this and more. What I'm trying to say is the horrors are not out there. The horrors are inside. But let's start with coffee. We're still waking up. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Clay. I thought maybe it would be helpful for the room just to give a quick overview of the book. Yeah, happy to. Um, perhaps you're familiar with the, the notion of climate anxiety. Um, this is not a book about climate anxiety. Climate anxiety is real, right? This sense of existential doom, perhaps a certain paralysis that we feel in the face of an impending, not so great future. Climate anxiety is about thinking about climate change. It isn't necessarily about what climate change does to us in terms of impacts on our inner biology. This is a book about the latter. And, and we can think about these effects in a couple of different ways. So perhaps you're familiar with the notion that when it's hot out, people are more aggressive, right? This is why we see more violence in the summers, for example. It's why we see elevated rates of domestic violence and aggravated assault. It's more benign than that. We see pitchers in baseball games more intentionally hitting batters when it's hot out. We see more aggressive penalties in football when it's hot out. We see more reports of uh, racial discrimination at the post office on hotter days. Right? There are dozens and dozens and dozens of econometric studies that illustrate the relationship correcting for all kinds of socioeconomic variables under the sun between temperature and behavior. Right? That there's this biological circuit that we can talk about if we want to, but there's a circuit that effectively controls the degree to which you are impulsive. And it happens to be temperature sensitive. Students are less good at taking exams 
on hot days, right? We aren't as good at problem solving in the heat. So, so a good third of the book is about these kind of neurocognitive impacts of something like heat, something like air pollution on the brain, the manners in which something like a temperature deflection is indeed causally related to our behavior as we navigate the world, the degree to which we're impulsive in our navigation of this world. That's about a third of the book. There's another third that thinks pretty critically and pretty directly about the manners in which a changing climate influences the likelihood of coming into contact with something like a brain disease vector. Right? So as the climate warms around the world and as various ecosystems shift, we're seeing range expansion of various brain disease vectors like ticks and mosquitoes, et cetera, et cetera. This is why we see spikes in things like Lyme disease. Right? One of the correlates of Lyme disease is a really horrifying uh, neurological disorder called neuroborreliosis kind of thing you don't want to catch. Um, yellow fever, uh, you know, a, a whole swath of mosquito-borne illnesses, Zika, right? These are, these are, you know, neuropathologies that even if we don't change our behavior, right, even if we continue to li live our lives exactly as we are, we now have a greater risk of encountering because the world is changing around us, right? So, so these are some other modes by which a changing climate bears directly on brain health insofar as as the climate changes, the risk profiles that our minds encounter change in kind. Right? Another example of this section of the book is the suggestion that uh, has materialized over the past 20 or 30 years of research into cyanobacteria, right, blue-green algae, that suggests as warming waters, especially freshwater systems, inculcate these uh, blue-green algae blooms, uh, the blooms in question release a neurotoxin. And that neurotoxin, which happens to be airborne, is one of the most uh, causal, uh, one of the strongest causal predictors uh, of neurodegenerative diseases like ALS, right? Something like uh, Lou Gehrig's disease uh, is, is maybe 10% in, in terms of the distribution of cases explained by genetics, right? Maybe 5% if we're, if we're being real here. The other 90, 95% of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis cases, and this is true of Parkinson's disease, it's true of Alzheimer's, most neurodegenerative disorders are not genetic, right? They, 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 they bear a reflection of an environmental influence. It's a relationship between environmental factors and your genetics, right, and your predispositions toward these various risk profiles. And, and so what scientists are suggesting these days is that as waters warm, as we see more runoff uh, from agricultural operations, and those synthetic fertilizers flow into streams and rivers, which then fertilize everything they touch, including these blue-green algae blooms. The blooms grow in size and frequency. They release more of the neurotoxin. The stuff is airborne. We see a corresponding increase in ALS downwind of these blooms. And this is a horrifying disease with no cure. The third of the book <laughs> that we haven't discussed is uh, you know, no less harrowing um, but, but a, a little more, I think, um, subtle in its impacts uh, that, that are described. Um, I think the easiest way to conceptualize some of these uh, final relationships between the environment and, and the mind are to think about them in terms of mental health. This is indeed where something like climate anxiety enters the picture, um, but that, again, I would, I would consider to be an indirect impact. Uh, the manners in which the climate bears directly on mental health is by way, for example, of experiencing something like a wildfire, something like uh, a hurricane, right? So let me just illustrate one quick study that came out of um, uh, Yoko Nomura's lab, who's a neuropsychiatrist at um, CUNY in New York. About 10, 12 years ago, um, she was recruiting a, a, a cohort of about 400 expecting mothers for a study that she was conducting on the relationships between stress and motherhood, right? Stress, infant mortality, stress, and the whole maternal child health cycle, right? And in order to do so, one needs to recruit a bunch of mothers uh, and assess the degree to which these exposures to which they come into contact uh, are or are not predictive of various health outcomes later in life, including in the neonatal period. Uh, and just as she'd finished recruiting uh, subjects for this study, Hurricane Sandy rolled into town. Right, so all of a sudden, she's got this natural experiment whereby half of her cohort uh, you know, consists of expecting mothers 
who are exposed to the storm. And half the cohort consists of uh, mothers and, and newborns who were either conceived after the storm um, uh, or indeed uh, were, were, were born um, uh, before it, right? So there's, there's this question of what does it mean to be in utero when a hurricane comes into town? And this is to say nothing of the PTSD that one might experience living through a traumatic event like a hurricane. What about the epigenetic relationships between the unborn child and the mother who has that traumatic experience? It turns out, and this is what we know now 10 years later, if you follow these children through life, the propensity of uh, the, the, the risk profile suggestive of things like um, um, behavioral outcomes um, related to uh, uh, OCD, uh, related to ADHD, related to depression, related to anxiety, uh, spike really quite alarmingly. We're, we're talking about the difference between a child um, expressing a, a, a risk of something like depression as young as preschool, 40x that of a child who was not exposed to the storm in utero. Right? Anxiety rates in, in young girls, 30x uh, those who were not exposed to the storm in utero. Right? Young boys uh, expressing ADHD at rates, again, dozens of times that uh, of the cohort not exposed to the storm. Right? And so the, the challenge with these types of studies is that uh, you can't just drum up a hurricane. And you also, uh, even if you could, right, you, you can't expose mothers selectively to a storm that you've just created, right? Profoundly unethical. Uh, and, and so you kind of have to wait around as a scientist and wait for something horrible to happen, and then wait a decade to see uh, what happens to the children who were exposed to this thing as a young person, or indeed as an unborn person. Uh, but we do occasionally have this unfortunate fortune of having these types of studies um, in place when the natural disaster occurs. Uh, and every time we ask this question, we see the same thing, which is that there is an epigenetic imprint of stress, right, of extreme stress on unborn children that follows them through life. And unfortunately, epigenetic changes are heritable, which means that their children, in turn, likely have increased risk profiles of the same neurocognitive conditions. Uh, so, so when we're talking about the mental health effects of climate change, again, I'm, I'm thinking really concrete here. I'm thinking about changes that are occurring as a function of exposure to natural disasters, as a function of exposure to extreme landscape loss, for example. Right? Another quick example is that folks who live uh, in mountaintop removal towns, uh, relative to people in other mining communities, specifically folks for whom a landscape drastically changes overnight, right? a bunch of mountaintops get lopped off, they tend to experience something like major depressive disorder Again, at a, at, at, at a rate, you know, something on the order of 1.5x or 2.5x that of corresponding propensity-matched cohorts in environments where you have a just as extractive industry that doesn't necessarily destroy the landscape. So there is something about landscape loss that influences uh, the, the likelihood of uh, a, a neurocognitive outcome, a mental health outcome. Um, and, and so, um, broadly, this is a book that seeks to weave together some of these ideas and suggest that, um, broadly speaking, climate change is, is, is not this thing that's in the future. It's not this thing that's happening in another place. And in fact, it's not really a story, in my estimate, of the weather, right? Climate change is a story of uh, brain health. It's a story of this, this intimate interiority and um, unfortunately, as the climate changes, we should expect to change in kind. And, and um, that story is not a particularly pretty one. I, I just want to briefly say there's a, there's a lot of scary stuff in here, and I, I tend to go on these slightly scary monologues. Um, but uh, this, this, isn't, this isn't a book of, 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 of doom and gloom per se, and I don't seek to leave anyone here in the fetal position, right? The, the, the idea is that these, these effects are real and they're serious, but we're not going to make any progress on the climate problem if we're ignoring them, right? And I think to the extent that we can engage with the intimacy of the climate crisis, as opposed to thinking about it as a future problem, as opposed to thinking about it of a, of a, of a 
if thinking about it as a problem of another place, um, we'll have a, a greater chance of responding to it appropriately because now we're talking about uh, protecting the lives of uh, our, our loved ones. Wonderful, thank you. So health impacts of climate change have been reported on, but this book has a couple of ideas early on that really switch up the lens and felt very novel to me and I'm sure would be novel to most of the people in the room. So I think as sort of setting the stage, it'd be great to talk through a couple of those ideas. Uh, the first of which is that climate is cultural expectation. Yes, um, so, so chapter one in this book is about memory and expectation. It's about looking backward and looking forward and the ways in which we consider what is or is not normal, what we expect about the future. And the reason that climate change in particular is a useful lens for thinking about some of those neuropsychological questions is that I, I argue that climate itself, right, the climate, as we tend to understand it, uh, is, is not a thing that exists in reality. The climate is a thing that exists in our minds. It is a figment of culture. The climate is an idea. Here's what I mean by that, right? Weather is real. Rain is real. When water falls from the sky and you put your hand out and it hits it, that's a thing that is happening. But the way that we define the climate and the way that we define climate change is through a construct of a series of statistical relationships. Right? We say that the climate in any given space uh, is a, 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 an average of 30 years worth of temperature data, right? 30 years worth of rainfall patterns. And uh, then we kind of move over to the next chunk in the spatial grid, and we ask that same question about that area. And that defines the climate at any given point in time. And of course, uh, changes in the variables in question. These statistical averages, for example, uh, are what we talk about when we talk about climate change. Right? We're talking about deviations from normal, where normal is defined by statistics. Right? We use the language of science. But we don't have to. Those are arbitrary decisions. For example, we could just as easily define climate change uh, using 50-year windows or using 100-year windows. Uh, we could use different meteorological variables. We could define it using a series of uh, atmospheric physical relationships as opposed to statements about rainfall. Uh, but we don't. We use uh, what I would argue is an arbitrary meteorological set of variables uh, defined over an arbitrary set of spatiotemporal windows. Uh, and these windows are useful to us insofar as they give us something to talk about. Right? We need to have something to talk about. We need to have something to notice. Because if we, if, we, if we can't wrap our heads around it, then we can't notice that it's changing. Right? So, so one of the great acts of climatology is giving us footholds. And it's these footholds that allow us to establish a sense of normality. Now again, it's great that we have climate science to define the climate for us. But we don't need to define climate change in terms of these meteorological variables because we know what the climate feels like, right? If you've lived in Montana for a lifetime, you know what it feels like to live here. And in fact, you might notice indeed that it has changed over time. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. But the point is, you don't need a meteorologist or a climatologist to tell you what the Montana climate is. It's something that you feel. It's something that scientists have used statistics to put a certain set of footholds around so we can articulate it to one another in very precise terms. But these are a series of arbitrary decisions. And the arbitrary decisions that we make to define the climate are therefore creations of the human mind. And I think that's a, that's a really important point here. The fact that weather is real, but climate is a cultural expectation. That's, that's a distinction that we're going to see arise, I think, a couple times perhaps in this conversation. And it's a useful orienting point for me, personally, because it redirects that conversation again toward the interiority that we're discussing here, right? Because if climate is an idea of the mind, if climate is an expectation about the way the world is supposed to look, sometimes we use the language of science to describe it, but we don't have to, then climate change should not connote for us something that's changing in the outside. It should connote a change that's occurring within us, right? It's not something that's changing. It is us changing. It is us updating our expectations of what connotes 
normality. And, and so when I say that climate is not weather, climate is cultural expectation, what I mean is the notion of climate change should suggest to us uh, something much closer to an updating of expectations about the way the world is supposed to work, an updating of expectations about what constitutes normal, uh, not we've moved from a one degree increase relative to pre-industrial times to a 1.5 degree increase relative to industrial times. Right? I think the, the kind of greatest crime that climate science has committed is trying to get the world to rally around this notion of a 1.5 degree Celsius threshold, because that number doesn't mean anything to anyone. And, and, and certainly, if you trace the causal path down from a 1.5 degree change to the effects that are felt by human beings and animals and economies, et cetera, et cetera, well, then you see that 1.5 degrees does matter. But that's not the status of the conversation. And, and I'm interested in the, the end of the causal chain. What are the effects of a 1.5 degree shift in global mean temperatures, the effects of a 2 degree shift in global mean temperatures? Because if we think a little more about the other end of the spectrum, and we pay attention to that interior conversation, the interiority, Notice that we're talking about an, up, an updating of expectations. Uh, I think we get a little closer to the intimacy that I think is required to make progress on the issue. Absolutely. When it comes to updating expectations, I think about how in Montana, we're now so used to August being smoky that when it's clear, it feels strange. Or the fact that, I mean, there's people going to college now who didn't know Montana before the pine beetle kill. They're, they've only known the forests of today with all the downfall, all the red. Um, and, and it's a, a function of our brains to sort of accept these massive environmental changes as normal. Um, and and that, the updating of expectations was really interesting to me because I realized just how much my own brain was trying to say that the, the, the increase in heat, the, the losses that we've been experiencing are normal. It's an act of forgetting. Um, and it, I, I think that it just, there's a lot that we can do to try and preserve the Montana of the past and reject the idea that it has always been this way. Um, you write it right the granddad was right when it comes to winters. Yes. Yeah, I think I think and it's, this is the other essential point here, right? So uh, Darby mentioned that there are kind of two core ideas that are useful orienting frames for this conversation. The first is that I think we ought to be thinking about climate as culture, climate as a cultural expectation that we have collectively articulated to ourselves. And there's this notion of the brain as a model. The thing that the brain does is model the world around us. So I'll just say two quick things on that, which, which is to, to, to lay out this uh, series of propositions that some theoretical neuroscientists have uh, you know, been availing over the past 30 years or so um, that, that suggest the, the, the primary function of this organ, and indeed the primary function of an organism writ large, uh, is to bear a modeling relationship with the world wrapped around it. And this, this is another kind of strange concept that uh, requires a, a little bit of a paradigm shift in how we think about what brains do. But it, the logic looks a little something like this, right? As we navigate the world, we, we have this, this organ that is capable of interfacing with it through a series of other secondary sensory organs, things like eyes and ears, noses, right? You can also think about your limbs uh, to a certain extent as sensory organs insofar as they allow you to ambulate and interact with that world using things like touch. So what is it that the brain does with the information it receives? Fundamentally, what it's trying to do is ensure that as you navigate the world, you're not surprised by it. And that's important because if you were in a constant state of surprise, you wouldn't really be able to get anything done, right? If, if you were surprised that the sky was blue, if you were surprised that you have two hands, if you were surprised that occasionally water does indeed fall from clouds, you would, you would be stuck in this kind of omnipresent state of awe. It would probably be quite terrifying, right? Instead, we're not surprised when those things happen. 
we're surprised when surprising things happen, right? If the sky were all of a sudden a dark shade of green, I would really pay attention to it. And that's because my expectations have been upset. So how does that happen neurologically speaking? What's, what's going on is that your brain is constructing, again, a series of statistical models, right? A set of relationships that describe what you ought to, as an agent navigating this world, expect as you interact with the environment, right? So, so when you encounter something that's surprising, when you count, encounter something that isn't necessarily in line with your expectations about the world, your brain says, whoa, that's not what I was expecting, and now I have to account for that in my model, especially if it's something that you experience again and again, right? Because if, if, if you remembered everything that you'd experience and never made these kinds of updates, you'd be in a similar situation such that, uh, a similar situation to the kind of constant state of fear and awe that you have two hands, uh, you'd be overwhelmed by memory, right? If you remembered everything that you experienced and weren't updating your model, uh, you, you'd be kind of stuck in the past, right? You, you would, you would uh, be kind of unable to uh, think about what the future might look like. You, 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 would, you would struggle to articulate yourself because every time you opened your mouth, you'd be uh, reflecting on the entire history of your life. Uh, and, and so instead, uh, your brain works really hard to just keep the important stuff influencing your decisions, just the things that you need to know to keep moving one foot in front of the other and navigate the world successfully. And, and that implies, Darby used the phrase active forgetting, it implies forgetting some of the things that you've experienced. So they're not influencing your model of the world inappropriately. And, and, and that's, the, that's the second really important point here. The fact that you have neural systems that are wholly in charge of competing with memory. Right? We, we often think of something like forgetting, for example, uh, as, as uh, the effect of uh, old age or the effect of neurodegeneration. Right? It's this aberrant thing that happens in our brains. We don't want to forget. Actually, forgetting is a really essential biological process because if we remembered everything, we wouldn't be able to get anything done. So, so you actually have to forget some stuff about the way the world used to be. You have to forget some stuff about what is no longer true if you want a better chance of interacting with the world in a way that allows you to navigate it successfully. And so that is what the brain does for you. That is what the brain does for your body. It looks around the world as you navigate it. It says, here are the expectations I currently hold about that world. And then when those expectations are upset, when the world changes, your brain says, well, I guess that's no longer true. If I want a shot at keeping this agent alive and navigating that world successfully, I'd better update the model. I would better, I'd better update the expectations. And, and notice what just happened there. Right? We're back to the, the, the idea of expectation which is exactly how we defined climate a couple minutes ago. So if, if we just very briefly braid these ideas together, I would argue it's, it's completely unsurprising that as the climate changes, we should expect to change in kind. Because this is the job of the brain. The job of the brain is to ingest the statistical relationships present in the world around us and set our conscious expectations of the world accordingly so we have the best shot at navigating that world and doing so in full health. Uh, the, the problem with that, the really insidious nature of this brain as model, uh, is that you kind of have this system inside your head that is whispering to you all the time that the world has always felt this way. So as the climate changes, in terms of these meteorological variables, in terms of the pine beetles, in terms of you know, changes in snowpack, for example, right? if you were born today, in 15 years, you would have a much different definition of what constitutes normal than somebody who was born 30 years ago, somebody who was born 50 years ago. And indeed, for somebody who was born 50 years ago, you may have a different idea of what constitutes normal today than you did 20 years ago. And that's because you are living. You are experiencing the world as it changes. And your brain is helping you understand that those changes now constitute the new normal and that you'd better wrap your head around this new normal if you want a chance at navigating the world with success. Absolutely. It suggests the porousness of self, that the brain is connected to the environment in a way that is just much more intrinsic than I had ever really thought about it. Um, 
you have said in the past that you don't find hope to be an interesting emotion. <laughs> um, that's why we get along so well. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I do feel like the, not necessarily a hopeful place, but the relationship with nature is fresh in a way that makes me feel more optimistic. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about just this sort of lens shift and what it can mean for our approach towards nature, our approach towards the environment, our approach towards neural health. Yeah, I mean, to, to be clear, I think hope can be a good thing. I just don't think it's de facto a good thing because I think, you know, under its worst impulses, hope can breed a lot of complacency, right? You, you, you can kind of just say, well, everything's going to work out. And in fact, it might not. And, and so I'm, I'm, I'm less interested in hope and, and more interested in um, what I would argue is a, is, a, is a kind of desire, right? I think the thing that we ought to be inculcating in ourselves is a picture of the world that we want and, and not a blind hope that that picture will materialize in reality, but instead a desire that we can move ourselves toward it. To me, desire is much more active than what I would argue is a certain passivity of hope. And, and where this conversation about climate as culture and the brain as model you know, enters the kind of hope versus desire dialogue for me is indeed in this notion of porousness, right? If, if, if you admit the contention that we are exposed to the world in a really intimate, vulnerable, porous manner, right, that as the environment pushes into you, you feel its influence. If you accept that premise, you also have to probably accept that the same is true in the other direction, right? That everything that we do has a corresponding effect in the world around us, right? So, so much of this conversation, especially when it comes to things like behavior, especially when we're talking about the relationship between heat and aggression, for example, that to me is a, is a, is a really difficult conversation to have because it really kind of constrains our notion of free will. We feel like we have free will, but I can, show you hundreds of papers that suggest that when the ther thermostat rises, you know, five degrees Fahrenheit, you're, you're X percent more likely to commit, you know, Y flavor of behavioral act. So where's the free will there, right? That, that's, that's this constraint on agency. And, and what I think the porousness to me actually suggests is that there's a certain ability to rescue agency. Because it's true that we're feeling these effects. It's true that the environment is bearing down on our brain health, on our behavioral health, on our mental health. Uh, and it's just as true that our actions are the world's perceptions, right? We think so frequently about the world acting on us and us sensing the world, right? Our sensations being the consequence of the world's actions. But mathematically speaking, and I would argue metaphysically speaking, the opposite is true as well. Our actions are the world's sensations, right? Every cause has an effect. And when we act, that's us reclaiming agency. And I don't think it's just with respect to our actions vis-a-vis -vis the natural environment. I think it's also with respect to our actions vis-a-vis -vis one another, right? If we can admit that we are porous, if we can admit that there is indeed a little bit of a dissolution of the self when we think about these questions, uh, that to me is a suggestion that just as there's less of a difference between me and the outside world than I would perhaps otherwise like to admit, there's also less of a difference between me and you than I would perhaps, again, all else equal, admit, looking across the room. We love to imagine ourselves as individuals. We love to think about uh, agency as this thing that powers decision making. And, and it's, 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 it's true that we have an innate sense of free will. And it's true that we have an innate sense of individuality, that there's this border that we can draw around our skin that separates us from the environment. Um, but unfortunately, that sense is flawed. And, and, and yet, I do think that in, in naming the porousness and naming the kind of Swiss cheese-like nature of environment versus person is also a suggestion that there's a little bit more of a Swiss cheese nature going on between people. And, and, and that's where empathy comes from, right? The ability to relate to one another, the ability to name 
the intimacy of these relationships and talk about them, the ability to communicate through storytelling with one another about the, the effects that we're observing, right? That's where we get to rescue agency in my estimate. So I do think it's about uh, 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 you know, having a, a, a more positive relationship, a more intimate relationship with the environment. Um, but you know, the end result of all of this for me is that I think it suggests we, there's a lot of capacity for us to be closer to one another as well. Absolutely. Speaking of story, I mean, you made a very interesting career choice to go from, you know, a, a data and a neuroscientist at Oxford to a environmental journalist, you know, two fields where there's not a lot of optimism. Um, why did you make this, this switch from science to storytelling? Well, um, I found myself in a basement lab in the UK, looking at a computer screen most of the time, uh, doing what I had told myself was my dream job, right? Modeling the brain. I was working as a computational neuroscientist, and that sounded glorious at the time. It sounded sexy. I was like, yeah, this is what I want to do. Cool. I can like introduce myself in public as a computational neuroscientist. That's kind of where the like currency. That's kind of where the currency stopped, though, be because um, my experience of that role was. Um, you know, kind of living in a box and looking at a screen. And um, so it, 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 it felt a little bit disconnected from the uh, full realm of human experience. And so um, I left the lab, and um, I think the manner in which I found my way to journalism was by convincing myself that there was a way to engage with science uh, that felt slightly more humanistic. Um, I think that the, the, the world of science journalism, the world of climate journalism, um, at its best, is, is a humanizing world. Um, so, so really, jumping into journalism from science was an effort uh, not so much to leave science behind, but, but to reframe it, right? To say that there are modes of asking questions about the natural world. There are modes of interfacing with experts asking these questions uh, that don't result in academic papers, uh, but still further knowledge uh, and, and still, I think, um, offer a, a, a certain sense of, um, I suppose, curiosity is the world. I think curiosity is one of the great engines of humankind, and um, the, greatest journalist, the, the greatest journalists are no less curious than the greatest scientists, right? In fact, some of the time, I think they're maybe even more curious. And, and so, um, it, 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 yeah, the shift for me was, was a means of engaging with similar material um, using slightly different methods. So we've talk, talked about sort of self and world, um, our place as a me enmeshed in place. Um, but I'm, I'm curious about place making. What sort of policy implications does this work have? Yes, um, great question. I mean, I imagine for a lot of people in this room, uh, this conversation is somewhat new in so far as we're, we're not really used to thinking about the climate problem as a, a brain health problem, uh, much less one uh, related to the intimacy of empathy, right? Um, and, and so the policy landscape, right, governmental responses to this new field that, you know, I'm, I'm kind of tentatively calling climatological neuroepidemiology, but because that's a mouthful, it says the weight of nature on the book. Um, the, the, the policy instruments you know, just kind of aren't there. And by way of example, uh, even, even the climate and health conversation, when it occurs, uh, mortality and morbidity estimates related to climate change are mostly a function uh, of things like respiratory disease, uh, to a certain extent heart disease, and malaria, right? Because again, you've got the mosquito problem. Um, those models have been around for about 20 years. They haven't been updated. Uh, and they certainly are not uh, inclusive of any of the conversation we've had today about brain health. Right? So, so if you ever see a headline that says, climate change is forecasted to cost you know, x billion in healthcare costs by 2050, uh, remember that it's a drastic underestimate, because we're basically just talking about malaria. If we want to be serious about 
accounting for some of these brain health costs. We need to run the numbers. So before we talk about infrastructure, right, and manners in which we can protect ourselves uh, in terms of adaptation responses, I would argue it's pretty essential that we wrap our heads around what we're even talking about in terms of scope and scale. Nobody's done that, right? Again, I, I, we've got decades of research that suggests that uh, warming waters and the resulting increase in size and frequency of blue algae blooms are in, in increasing the frequency uh, of something like ALS. Um, but we don't have any numbers that suggest uh, the, the, the scale of that problem at a, at a global level. Um, and I think it would behoove us to, you know, indeed think quantitatively about uh, some of the issue at hand, right? Because for better or for worse, climate policy is a function of cost-benefit analysis, right? Governments only act on climate when it's quote unquote worth it. And what, you know, what's the definition of worth it? Basically, your, in, your investment in climate action uh, has to, uh, the, the benefits thereof, you know, need to offset the costs. And, and so um, I would argue that we're basically kneecapping climate policy uh, if we are not somehow also uh, doing a better job of accounting for the benefits of climate action. If, if climate action is something that can help ease the dementia burden through 2050, we should be making that argument because it's going to be a heck of a lot easier to act on climate. Um, so I think there's, there's, a, there's a shift that needs to take place uh, you know, almost, almost at that ontological level in climate policy. In terms of like municipal level responses, it's, it's a lot of really basic stuff, right? Unfortunately, a lot of those things are Band-Aids. Air conditioning really helps. Air filtration systems really help, right? Because if, if something like uh, a high school, if somebody like a high school student is you know, losing five points or 10 points or 100 points on the SAT because it's a hot day, you, know, you can basically fix that problem by putting an air conditioner in a classroom. We should be doing that. Because uh, I just saw a study you know, a couple of weeks ago that, that basically says if you account for uh, the, the um, spatial distribution, which is inequitable, of air conditioning around the country, right? because richer schools are more likely to be air conditioned, for example. And then, you know, again, correct for all the sociodemographic variables under the sun. Really just isolate the effect of the presence of air conditioning. Uh, basically that spatial distribution of air conditioners around the country explains like 5% of the racial achievement gap. That's an astounding number, right? And it's, it's, again, it's one of those things where if we had the political will and snapped our fingers and installed an air conditioner everywhere we needed one, you could eliminate that gap, 5% of it. Um, so, so there are a series of Band-Aid policies that I, that I think are useful related to you know, subsidization of certain technologies. Um, but beyond that, though, I, I, I do think that municipalities in particular have an opportunity uh, to think about neurological health through climate policy and, and environmental policy writ large. It's things like street trees, right? It, and it, it, it's things like you know, having access to low emission zones in cities. It's uh, about ensuring that uh, residential populations aren't sited, uh, or, or excuse me, you know, industrial sites aren't sited next to residential populations, right? These are zoning decisions that cities get to make. Where do, you, where do you put your point source emitters? You know, maybe don't put them next to people. And if you have you know, maybe done the good work of permitting appropriately and ensuring that uh, you, you now have a series of uh, dirtier industries under control such that uh, the exposure on the ground isn't what it used to be, well, that's all well and good. But you know, maybe after one of these facilities moves, don't put a house on top of it before you have done some really serious soil remediation. I mean, again, we have the policy tools to think pretty aggressively about uh, how to respond to the climate problem and to some of uh, the, I would argue, you know, industrial influencers thereof. Um, we just tend not to think about them as investments in brain health. We don't think about them as investments in mental health, in behavioral health. And uh, so frequently, city and state governments are you know, kind of ringing the bell of behavioral health care and, and how governments are supposed to be stewards of behavioral health, stewards of mental health. And you know, I think one argument to make is that, well, we can actually make a little bit of progress uh, on that issue by using climate policy. Wonderful. So I think we are going to take some questions from the audience. Sure, great, yeah, There'll please. There'll be a microphone that's going around in a minute here. Um, 
but thank you. I mean, as you can see, this is just a, a novel way of looking at climate change, a novel way of looking at our brains that I think uh, has huge implications for how we do policy, how we think about soft infrastructure. So when it comes to adaptation, we're often talking about building seawalls, but how do we build a more resilient people? How do we anticipate some of these changes? Um, and I think some of that is through mental health uh, infrastructure. Some of that is, as you mentioned, through storytelling, that there's a lot of work that can be done. And I just really thank you for shedding light on this issue. Yeah, yeah, thanks. No, I, 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 I um, would also add, in addition to some of this infrastructure that we're describing, you know, there, there's also the, the interior infrastructure that we can work on. Uh, and what I mean by that, I'm going to borrow a phrase from uh, the neuropsychiatrist I mentioned earlier, Yoko Nomura, she, she calls it biological resilience. And, and, it's, and it's actually quite different uh, from, from mental resilience, right? Uh, her notion of biological resilience has much more to do um, with, with shoring up uh, the types of uh, systems, types of neurological systems that uh, you know, can protect us from some of the harshest effects of a changing climate in terms of brain health. Um, how do we get there? I mean, again, it's investments in a certain flavor of healthcare, but, it, but it's also thinking about the manners in which we react to some of these environmental vectors that we're talking about, right? I think part of the issue here is that um, while we all may be familiar with this suggestion that people are more aggressive in the heat, for example, um, we don't really check ourselves when it happens to us. You know, it's just kind of something we shrug off, like, oh yeah, I was a little more irritable today. Like, of course I was more irritable, it was hot out. And yet, there's something to be said about being mindful in the moment, recognizing when that heat is acting on you, recognizing that perhaps you are going to be a little quicker to the trigger on a really hot day, and noting that if you're feeling more impulsive, maybe that's like a moment to take a breath. Right? I think there's a whole lot to be said for a series of mindfulness practices that are basically a function of noticing what's going on in your body as it's happening. And, and, and we can spend you know, as much time as you want talking about uh, the evidence base of, of, of mindfulness, but I think so frequently it's, it's spoken of in these kind of highfalutin or new age terms. The neuroscience of mindfulness is exceptionally compelling. And, and, it is, and it is a neuroscience that says, if these behavioral effects we're experiencing as a function of environmental change, for example, are rooted in something like impulsivity, are rooted in something like the disruption of brain networks that control the balance between rational decision making and emotional decision making, mindfulness is what restores that balance. Right? And we, we, we have the electrophysiological recordings, we have the fMRI results, we have you know, all of these neuroscientific variables under the sun that illustrate that these types of awareness practices are, are able to restore the kinds of losses of function uh, that we experience in the heat and under air, con uh, excuse me, under uh, you know, high levels of air pollution or high levels of ambient carbon dioxide. Uh, so so I, I do think that there's you know, something pretty profound to be said for, for this type of work on internal infrastructure as well, not just how we, how we build our cities. Um, so, sorry, I've gone on another monologue mm -hmm. here, but if anybody has any questions, um, I'm sure either of us would be delighted to, to answer them, or at least try. Good morning. This has been a great presentation. Um, but my concern is that the people here, I'm sure, are on board with your message and support it, but how do we get this message out to a wider audience, the general public? Uh, you look at the politicians, many of them are uh, deniers of climate change. And how, how do we get this message out to more people? Yeah, well, it's the question of the hour, right? Um, and, and for me, the argument looks something like um, what I said a little bit earlier, which is to say that um, I think, I think you know, the, greatest the greatest crime that climate science has committed is trying to rally people around a, you know, two-digit decimal number. Um, I think instead, we need to be making arguments about people. I think we need to be making arguments uh, about really serious health effects that are likely to be experienced uh, over the next 50 years, and indeed today, right? I just read a tweet this morning that said uh, in you know, agricultural communities, 
uh, where bat populations have declined, right? And we know there's a relationship between climate change and biodiversity loss. In agricultural communities where bat populations have declined, uh, over the past couple of years, we've seen an increase in, in insecticide use by about 31%. And because insecticides are, of course, awful for newborns, we see an infant mortality rate increase uh, by about 8%. Okay, so again, staggering number. And, and I would argue that, I mean, I don't know too much about bats. I don't know if there's a, a climate variable at play here. But let's say there is. Let's say this is kind of a clean-cut uh, attribution story wherein you can trace a through line from climatic variable change to increase in infant mortality. I haven't the faintest clue why we're talking about climate variables in that case, when we could be talking about infant mortality rates. And because people care about dead children, as well they should. When I think about aging populations, right, Japan, for example, is in the middle of a public policy crisis because uh, the, the, the distribution of age in that society looks very different than it does uh, in many other places of the world. In particular, uh, you, you have a, a rapidly aging population uh, with effectively not enough young people to support it. What does that mean? It means you have an influx, disproportionately speaking, of uh, various dementias, various neurodegenerative diseases, uh, huge costs in, you know, huge rising costs in elder care, et cetera, et cetera. That's the same kind of thing that we're going to see uh, given the predicted increases uh, in neurodegenerative effects of a changing climate all around the world, right? I think there's a great case to be made uh, for low-level inflammation as a function of heat, as a function of air pollution, uh, driving increased rates of anything from mild cognitive impairment all the way through to Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, et cetera, et cetera. Why are we talking about 1.5 degrees Celsius, 2 degrees Celsius, when we could be making arguments about uh, a dementia epidemic, right? Again, I, I think there's a communications exercise that probably needs to be undertaken here, and it's a, commun a communications exercise that says, okay, politician, if that's the target audience here, it's fine that we might disagree on the state of the science it, with respect to climate climate science. I don't even care anymore. I'm not going to try to convince you that the climate is changing if you don't believe me. However, you should probably be concerned about the fact that your kid is going to lose a couple points on the SAT on hot days. If you want to increase their probability of success later in life. You should probably be concerned about the fact that you know, they're growing up with an increased likelihood of contracting uh, you know, really serious, whether mental health or behavioral, behavioral health or uh, neurological health disorder as a function of some of these other variables. Um, and, you know, that's where I have a, a, a harder time uh, agreeing to disagree. It's like you, you, you don't accept the, cli the climate science. Uh, there's so much polarization and hyperpartisanship around that issue. Fine, we're not going to make any progress there. Uh, however, I would, I would argue that there's a, <laughs> more of a moral imperative to find, to find common ground on issues like dementia epidemics and, and dead children, right? So um, the reframe for me is, again, about humanization, uh, and it's about um, you know, the really serious healthcare effects that um, I think we're already seeing play out now and are unfortunately only going to get worse over the next couple decades. Yeah, I think this reframing really opens up conversations where there might have been stalemates before. So I saw a study that uh, found that if China changed its air standards to that of the EPAs, it would be the equivalent of every single person in that country gaining an additional year of education. So it's just reframing things in, in, in ways that people care. Um, I, I think that there's just certain segments of the population that aren't going to care about that. But when it comes to dead children, absolutely. Um, so I, I think that this book really offers an opportunity to meet people in different places. You really came to the uh, ray of sunshine talk at 9 a.m. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, have you engaged with uh, Ian McGilchrist's books, The Master and the Emissary and Matter of Things? He was a, I think, Cambridge 
uh, you know, humanities literary guy who decided to go into neuroscience and became a psychiatrist and studied the the right and left brain uh, from a neurological point of view, not the popular thought about it. And he's written two really fascinating books about, you know, the right brain is supposed to be the the integrator of experience, and the left brain kind of is really good at getting things done, being really focused, but is often clueless about the impact of that. And he's claiming that we are in a kind of left brain takeover epidemic, and he goes through the last 500 years of intellectual history showing how there have been these uh, ups and downs of that. And I, I find it a fascinating. He's he's all over YouTube talking now, and because of his neuro neuroscience connection, I think you two would it'd be a wonderful conversation between the two of you. So I mm. think check him out if you haven't uh, yeah, in, engaged him at all. No, that's great. I, I'm not familiar, but yeah. I think it's, you know, it's really true. I, I'm, uh, you know, not particularly well versed on you know, that particular line of inquiry, but in terms of the relationships between the networks in our brain, right, I, I tend to think less about brain regions and more about connections between brain regions, right, and the networks that are formed as regions interact with one another. And my understanding of that literature, you know, is suggestive of some of those same results, right, that you, you, you do, uh, as a decision maker in this world, very frequently balance between something like critical thinking, rationality, uh, maybe that's, you know, the quote-unquote left brain take, per se, uh, versus something uh, like what the limbic system has to offer, things like the amygdala, what they have to offer, right? Emotional responses to the world around us, right? It's, it's very frequent in, in my estimate to encounter, uh, you know, representations of emotional decision making um, that, that are somewhat pejorative, right, or, or, or you know, frowned upon and by some other means that right, we should always be uh, the, the, the rational decision maker. Um, and I spent so much time over the past hour and a half here, you know, talking about the ways in which impulsivity, right, that limbic system, sometimes creeps in. I don't mean to suggest that we ought not to be making emotional decisions, because in, 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 in no small part, I think it is our ability to relate to one another through emotion, right, and our ability to relate to our own bodies through sensation and emotion that affords an ability to navigate the world successfully right, inability to indeed solve some of these problems that we're enumerating up here. And, and so in, in, in terms of the kind of grand balance, neurologically speaking, sure, but I would, I would say we're maybe talking more epistemologically at this point, the balance between rational thought, you know, kind of capital R rationalism, and, and something like impulsivity, something like emotional thought, something maybe called humanistic thinking, that balance is quite important, and, and, I, and, and I don't want to um, by any means suggest that uh, we ought to be favoring rationality uh, all the time over humanistic thinking or emotionality, because it's, it's in the balance that we find the richness of human experience, uh, and it is in the balance that uh, we define ourselves as something other than an automaton, right, a robot that just makes decisions as a function of some kind of optimization function. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, I appreciate you bringing up land use policy. That's the arena I work in. Um, considering that our policymakers and many Montanans struggle to see the full impacts of climate change, um, in part due to our low population numbers and yeah, just our climate here, um, I believe we're gonna see more in migration due to climate. Um, what do you feel out of your research would be most relevant to Montanans? And um, if you could give us anything convincing for our policymakers, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, well, if anybody solves the uh, political will question, let me know. <laughs> but um, what I will offer is, is that uh, while I don't know a whole lot about the Montana climate context, um, I have spent a fair amount of time in the state, you know, over the past decade, and 
uh, one thing that I understand about it is uh, that there's a, there's a certain relationship to place that I don't necessarily find, even in my home state of Minnesota, which is not to knock my state. I love it. Land of 10,000 lakes. There are actually 11,000, but we don't put that on the license plates. <laughs> the, the rootedness in Minnesota has a different flavor than the rootedness that I see and experience in Montana. Right? When I talk to people from here, when I talk to ranching families, I'm having a conversation about roots that feels very different uh, from the one that I tend to have at home. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because so much of um, the, the kind of capital M mental health effects that uh, I've come across in terms of landscape change um, are indeed about the intimate relationships between place and identity, right? Identity, neurologically speaking, is, is this process that we go through, right? The formation of identity is, is kind of this multi-tiered process, right? And the first thing you need to do when you're born is figure out that you are a self at all, that you are, in fact, somewhat distinct uh, from the environment and from other people. And I know we pushed back a little bit on that distinction over this talk, but you know, it's useful to know where you kind of start and stop. Uh, and then you need to get a sense of your preferences. You need to understand what you like. You need to understand uh, that you prefer to look a certain way. If you catch a glimpse of yourself in the mirror, right, your identity is occasionally predicated on this uh, recognition of self and aligning that self with your preferences. But then after that, the rest of identity construction, construction is uh, a, a function of affiliating yourself with groups and practices and place. Right? There's, a, there's, a, there's a reason that I imagine you know, many people in this room would introduce themselves as Montanans, right? would introduce themselves as primarily having a relationship with place. And indeed, what the research tends to show in terms of like, the neuropsychiatry at play is that when place changes, because place is so fundamental, and indeed perhaps even more fun fundamental in an environment like this one, with the construction of identity, of course identity is going to rupture in kind. I don't know if that argument, as I just articulated it, is ever going to convince a policymaker that they ought to act on climate. But I, what I would say is that when we think about the relationships we have with land, the relationships we have with place, with landscape, with horizon, with working the land, those are the relationships that are at risk in terms of climate change. Right? It's, 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 it's to me, you know, again, it's never about what happens in the atmosphere. It's, it's always about what's happening in here. And because place is so fundamental in the construction of identity, it's necessarily about what's happening on the ground in front of you. And um, what, what, you know, the, the, I, I had started this sentence but uh, somehow didn't manage to finish it. What the literature tends to show uh, is, is that the, the primary correlates of mental health that we see disrupted upon landscape change. Things like uh, major depressive disorder symptomology, rates of uh, you know, generalized anxiety disorder, et cetera, et cetera. Um, these, these kind of primary mental health correlates. Um, if, you, if you kind of construct a causal model, forget the neuroscience at play, just think about the psychology, right, and the underlying uh, psychiatric literature. And you, and you ask, well, how is it that something like place, something like landscape change could influence the likelihood of somebody presenting with major depressive symptomology? And you could think about effects on, gosh, I don't know, industry. You could think about effects on, again, atmospheric physics. You could think about effects on uh, streams and rivers and our relationships with those. The actual line that any psychologist draws from landscape to mental health is always through identity. It's, it's always through this notion that ourselves are indeed grounded in place. And, and maybe this is misguided uh, because I'm, no, I'm not a Montanan, but my experience of this state is uh, one of place-based identity. And so perhaps there's even a greater likelihood of seeing some of the really serious mental health correlates of landscape change here 
relative to other places in the world. And maybe that's a starting point for having a conversation. Um, because uh, again, you know, I can't get anybody to care about 1.5 degrees Celsius, but um, it's, it's a lot easier to get people to care about their own children and um, indeed to um, get them to care about um, the, the places that they call home. You know, we're talking about home changing. I would add just a much less eloquent addition to that in that when it comes to land use changes, there are going to be more people becoming Montanans. And we need to grapple with that socially and update our zoning to allow more building. So YIMBY over NIMBY, if that's. So if we are <clears throat> normalizing things that change so that it doesn't surprise us all the time, how do we trigger alarm at that change? Um, because we have made it an accepted norm. So how do we get people to respond to the fact that the change isn't necessarily good? I don't know. I have a, <laughs> I have a lot of art projects up my sleeve that I think would get us close. I think the answer is truly we need to get creative about raising the alarm. Um, the, the reason that I turn to creativity and artistic practice in thinking about this question is because I think for me the most meaningful moments in which I have come into contact with a sense of alarm as a function of noticing change is when I'm offered visual evidence of that change. Right? Darby and I were in the high Arctic in October and very frequently we found ourselves in front of glaciers that had receded. We didn't know that they had receded insofar as we hadn't seen what they looked like 50 years ago until somebody showed us a picture, right? I think that there ought to be every five miles of the freeway a photo of what that patch of land looked like 50 years ago, right? I think we need reminders that the world has changed, right? Because our our, our, our internal systems are working against us in that manner. They are encouraging us to forget. And, and so uh, by any means necessary, we need to remember. Because it is, I think, in, in the act of comparison, right, this, this memory versus expectation, memory versus normalization, uh, that we can kind of resurrect a sense of alarm, resurrect a sense of surprise. For me, a lot of the time that happens visually, if I am in front of a place, and see a picture of what it used to look like. But it can also happen through storytelling, right? Oral traditions are really, really good at offering representations of what the world used to look like and no longer does. I mean, the entire practice of history is kind of predicated on this notion that it's important to understand the past such that we can learn from it. And, and there are different modes of approaching history, right? You can tell stories. Right, especially when it comes to learning about collapse or learning about uh, disasters in the past, moments at which societies needed to come back. <laughs> there are different approaches to telling those stories. There are those that say, uh, we ought to tell these stories so we can alarm people insofar as we can scare them into doing something. Here's this terrible thing that happened. Let's make sure we don't do that. I find that that type of storytelling tends to, tends to shut people down. There's, there's another type of historical storytelling that says, let's think about this idealized past, right? When people were just in you know, beautiful, uh, intimate relationships with nature, you know, and there were kind of butterflies everywhere. And uh, it'd be great to kind of return to this, this sense of interconnectedness that we somehow have, uh, somehow used to have, but have lost. And I fear that that mode of storytelling is, is, is also um, a little bit risky because there's this, there's this idealization a lot of the time referring to, you know, a past that maybe never exactly existed, right? I, and, and I think there's often, in particular, a romanticization of indigeneity in, in those types of narratives that is unhelpful in thinking about a contemporary context. I think the types of historical t storytelling that are most useful in kind of motivating action are those that tell stories of resilience, right? Those that tell stories of societies and communities that did encounter 
great strife, natural disaster, calamity of all flavors, and did something to change either their behavior or their circumstances such that that society continued to persevere, such that that community was able to resurrect itself in the face of great danger. And, and those stories of resilience, I think, offer more of a blueprint than certainly the, the fear-based storytelling can do. Uh, and I would argue also more than the uh, idealization of the, the you know, kind of communing with nature narratives can do. So um, I don't know. I'm kind of stumbling through an answer here because the, 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 the TLDR is I don't know. Um, but if I had to you know, offer some sense of a, a suggestion, it would be we need to remind ourselves what the world used to look like and the stories we tell ourselves about what that world, about what that world used to look like ought to be grounded in narratives of resilience. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that I read about fairly frequently is the impact of environment on our bodies. And I'm going to assume that's also in, going to include our brains through nano or microplastics getting into our bodies, which is something that seems to me is pretty clearly man-made because I don't think these things existed 40 or 50 or 60 years ago. Is there any research on the impact this could be having on our brains and our mental health and mental state? Very little. Um, however, we're at least beginning to uh, wrap our heads around the extent to which the problem exists at all. So just maybe a month ago, and maybe you saw this study, uh, it was reported that now 0.5% uh, zero, 0 of all human brain matter is just microplastics. So take your brain out of your skull, scoop out one two hundredth of it, you know, take your brain, split it into two hundred chunks, one of those chunks is just plastic. <laughs> That's just true of all of us at this point. And it's because of the relationships, relationships we have with microplastics. Um, I think in 50 years, we're going to look at plastic use and microplastic exposure in the same way that today we talk about cigarettes, for example, uh, or the same way that we talk about, you know, stuff that was occurring in you know, the late 19th century, for example, right? Like, oh yeah, it's probably not a good idea uh, to be you know, cooking with coal indoors. That, that, like, that, would, that would be foolish. Uh, why did people ever think that that was okay? Right? And now we kind of have a similar conversation about smoking, like, oh yeah, duh, like, of course it's gonna give you lung cancer. Uh, and yet, um, we're not having that conversation yet about microplastics. And I think that's because we don't have an answer uh, to the, the, the kind of physical health correlate question that you asked. If I had to spitball an answer here, I would say again that what we know about environmental exposures on the brain writ large and their propensity to increase our risk of experiencing or presenting with neurodegeneration later in life, for example, are wholly contingent on low-level inflammation. Right? If you inhale particulate matter, whether from wildfire smoke or industrial smog, if you're doing that on a somewhat regular basis, diesel exhaust, uh, what's going on when that particulate matter enters your uh, nose is it you know, basically is able to hitch a ride on your nasal nerve all the way to the brain. And because PM 2.5 is very, very, very small, it can often cross that blood-brain barrier and get right up into that tissue. So what happens when it's there? You have cells for dealing with this, right? They're, 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 they're called glia, right, microglia. They're basically interneurons that you know, don't necessarily have a communicative function. They don't store memory. Uh, they're, they're the brain's immune cells. And, and what they do is they respond to this stuff and they say, oh gosh, this isn't supposed to be here. It's a heavy metal. What is it doing in the brain? And you have an immune response. Immune responses are often associated with low-level inflammation. That's fine. But the problem is we can't flush these molecules out of our brains. There, there's, there's no mode of breaking them down. Uh, there's, there's not really a way for removing them in the same way that we can do with a lot of organic molecules. And so um, instead, that 
low-level inflammation persists. And if you have persistent chronic low-level inflammation as opposed to uh, you know, acute point source inflammation, all of a sudden you have a series of additional biological cascades uh, that unfortunately uh, lead exactly and precisely to neurodegeneration, right? If you have uh, a, a series of um, inflammatory promoters in your brain hanging out for a long time, eventually they're going to become um, neurotoxic, effectively. And, and neurotoxicity results in necrosis. It results in cell death. And, and so um, the, the theory of air pollution and indeed of extreme heat exposure, which is also neuroinflammatory, the, the theory of um, uh, neuroinflammation and neurodegeneration is, I think, well proven at this point and, and well understood to be at play when we're inhaling things like PM2.5. It would shock me if that weren't also the case for microplastics. I'm not aware that those studies have been conducted. Maybe they have. But it would, it would shock me if the 0.5% of our brain matter that is apparently plastic wasn't causing low-level inflammation and thereby increasing our risk of neurodegeneration later in life. I think we have time for a couple more questions. I want to bring this back to, in the state of Montana, there's a lot of discussion of connection to the land and connection to place. And there's a lot of influx of people who are from a different place. So their connection to place, as they bring it to here, and maybe even the reasons that they moved here, may be more connected to where their original source of place is than where they now exist in Montana and can, and by the way, it's a lot to chew on. I mean, it's a whole mouthful what you're saying, so I, I don't pretend to comprehend it, but um, could you shed a little light when you, on, in a general sense, when you get two populations that are from multiple places and they've all moved to this place that they want to preserve on one hand or whatever their motivation is. How do you reconcile that? I think we're asking this question in more places than Montana. I think we ask it every time we have a conversation about climate migration, for example. Anytime we have a conversation about immigration writ large, migration writ large, what does it mean to encompass multiple distinct populations within a single place? I'm going to defer to the Montanan okay. in the room who might have a little bit more context to share. But what I would, what I would very briefly offer is that um, I think you're right that this is a huge challenge, that inevitably somebody is going to bring with them, regardless of motivation for migrating, somebody is going to bring with them a whole suite of experiences and expectations and indeed fears and identities uh, that may be quite different from the place in which they've now found themselves. And in terms of relationship with the land, if the Montana landscape changes, if the snowpack and the temperature and the you know, forests are in a different state today than they were 10 years ago, somebody like a migrant from California isn't going to know that. Mm. And in fact, this place may st still seem like a, an idealized uh, you know, frontier that is somehow protected in a way that uh, their home was not from wildfire or extreme heat, what have you. And, and that core challenge, again, the shifting of baselines for what constitutes normal, that core challenge, it's an, it's an unsolved problem. And it, and, it, and it permeates, I think, a lot more than just conversations about migration. It's, 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 it's everywhere. It's the fact that Scientists who are entering school today and pumping out climate models, estimating insect populations, taking a look at what streams and rivers ought to be doing, their definition of normal as young scientists 
is very different from the definition of normal for those who have been in the field for 30 or 40 years. And so as stream conditions worsen or as the landscape changes, sure, you've got folks who are studying it, but the definition of change is different to different populations. And squaring that circle, figuring out how to uphold in equal terms and also acknowledge that these are distinct experiences, the, 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 the types of changes that people experience, I mean, that's like, that's like the core question of empathy and how we relate to one another. And, and again, you know, if, if anybody's got great ideas for treating other people as human, uh, I'm all for it. Um, but sometimes it, it can be a challenge. Sometimes we only want to see ourselves as the most human among us. And, and th I think those are the impulses that are worth you know, pushing back against the most when we see ourselves kind of othering uh, 